All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, Professor Barry here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So first couple of weeks of the term, kind of lay out the framework of sociology, kind of like the sociological perspective, thinking about the micro level, individual level, perceptions, ideas, self-concept, how we come to interpret the world, uh, how we come to see self and other, that's all that sort of micro level, maybe getting into language a little bit, like the superior wharf hypothesis, but ultimately that interactionist perspective is on the focus on development of meaning and perception and ideas. Uh, so it's gonna get us into culture, our social groups, all those different kinds of things. Macro level, conflict theory, functionalism, looking at the larger kind of structure of society itself, conflict theory, kind of a more of a model of social justice, of trying to um, <clears throat> examine where inequalities are, the roots of those inequalities, where they come from, to create a more just, more democratic society. And then the functionalist perspective, kind of the view of society as a problem-solving entity, society working to bring balance and order, the importance of integration of people into society, into, into core values and ideas, kind of the glue, culture is the glue that holds society together. Um, so that's kind of the general idea of laying out the sociological perspective, thinking about the relationship between individuals and society, moving away from individual kind of only explanations that people are, you know, like somebody commits crime, they're, they're a bad person. It's like, well, it's a decision they made. Let's think about the decision, the decision-making process. So like, what are all the social cultural influences that go into shaping, influencing human behavior? So we're looking at kind of that interaction between individuals and society themselves. So for this week, um, yeah, we're moving into uh, an area where we're gonna be looking at more that micro level, uh, more so socialization, interaction, um, between self and society, some different models of self, and then move into um, looking at some groups. Just kind of touching down on some con and con concepts, theories, areas. There's a lot to cover. Uh, we're not going to be able to cover it all. We're just kind of laying out some sort of just different frameworks, ways of thinking about the self, trying to incorporate a more sociological view of the self. So we think about the self, we're looking at that relationship between the individual in the social world. So you are living in a particular moment in time. You were coming of age, so to speak. You were born at a particular moment in time. You can't. You uh, were coming of age at a certain moment in time. Uh, different during that cultural moment in time, there were cultural ideas about gender, about race. Uh, there were ideas that were you know, the way society was structured in terms of the economy itself, uh, the kind of work that people were doing, like that's gonna get us to start to think about that our ideas of the self are, like we don't emerge into the world with the concept of self. So that's the idea of self is gonna be influenced and shaped by the social world. So the larger macro level world, as well as the micro level world in terms of our groups that we belong to, our connection and all those different kinds of things. A lot of different theories on the self. The main ones that sociology sociologists kind of go to in thinking about the self are Cooley, Mead, and Goffman. And there's particular reasons for that is because these theories of development or theories, ideas of self help to integrate the ideas of, integrate into an idea of self, that social world kind of component so that the self is not created in isolation from the environment and the context, but it's actually a relationship between the two. So we'll talk about Cooley and the looking glass self, talk about Mead and Mead's ideas of the self, and then Goffman's uh, ideas of dramaturgy. So think about on a couple different examples, um, you know, math and writing abilities. Sometimes people, I hear this, heard this before from math instructors, that some students have an idea that they're just no good at math. Well, that's learned somewhere, right? Or write, or maybe writing. Um, that is learned, reinforced, becomes a self-image idea, a concept, something that people incorporate. Maybe even they identify that I, I just, I'm no good at math. I've never been, my brain doesn't work that way. These are all things that people may have told themselves over time and what, you know, but it, the reality is this is something that they've, that individuals have learned and it's been reinforced in different environments. I mean, math instructors will tell me time and time again, it's not that people can't do it, or it's like their brain's not wired that way. It's just that 
something along the way they've convinced people have convinced themselves they can't do that work and then they reinforce that so this is like kind of the idea like where, where does that idea come from and the complexity of the formation of ideas of self could be things related to like you know whether a person's smart or not or body image i mean ideas of body image think about that there's a time period historically in western culture 1500s uh let's say where food scarcity was more common than food abundance and uh, that body size and a larger body size was a symbol of, of wealth and status and privilege. So larger bodies, what we view as sort of obesity today was viewed as a sign of social standing. Um, so somebody's body and their body image, gendered ideas of body image and then how we see the self. I mean, this is all related to the self, right? And so you kind of get the picture where we're going with sociology as we're looking at that body image we don't you know, we start to develop that in that social cultural environment. And we're curious as a sociologist, curious about how the, the self forms, but also curious about those social cultural things that are going on and how we think about those forces that are influencing to some degree on um, our own identity. So Mead is a theorist to George Herbert Mead and Mead and Cooley, the two that we're going to, we'll talk about three theorists, Cooley, Mead, and, or Mead, Cooley, and, and, and uh, Goffman. Mead and Cooley are contemporaries. They're writing the 19, 1950s, 1960s, the ideas of the self. Um, and uh, they're a little bit different, but there's a lot of similarities between the two. So I kind of lay out the foundations of both of them. So one example, like, you know, for, you know, think about the job interview or maybe attending class or going to the, even going to the bathroom, like how we engage in those activities are all learned. I use the example of going to the bathroom to illustrate that we all have to, we all have to go to the bathroom. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's a requirement, right? Being human, we have to do that. But how we do that when we're in the presence of others, if we're by ourselves, if we're in nature or we're at home, we're in a public restroom versus private restroom, there's a lot of learning that's happened in terms of how we engage in those environments. And that would be the focus of need, not the physiological act of going to the bathroom, but the actual how we do that in terms of a social expression uh, or a, yeah, as a, as a social behavior is more of a focus on need. So meat is a behaviorist, everything for a behaviorist, everything is learned. Uh, our sense of gender is learned. Uh, how we engage in the social world is learned. You know, so it's like, we may have an innate capabilities, but the focus of behaviorists is like, how do, does our behavior, how is that behavior learned over a period of time? Humans are social creatures. So we are belonging and connection is important to us. Uh, we learn by being around others. We learn ideas of self. Mead makes a distinction between the I and the me. The I is the subject of self when we're not the object of attention. So if I'm at home by myself, uh, it's more my subjective self, a self that's not thinking about how other people um, see me or not being, a, uh, being in an environment where there are no others that are observing me. It's much more my subjective self. It's not necessarily my true self, it's just my subjective self. And then you get the me, which is your objective self, where a person becomes the object. They become aware that other people are observing them and making some judgment about them, whether bad or good, just making some observation of them. And there's a sort of like this interplay between the two. We have the subjective self, but then we have the objective self and there's an, an, a relationship going on between the two. I'm thinking about going to the job interview. When I'm at home and I'm in my subjective self, but I'm imagining how another person, that person who's going to be interviewing me, how they might observe my behavior, the way in which I engage in that environment. So automatically I'm going to the space where it's this interaction between the subjective and the object. And this is how we're forming a sense of our own self is through that process. Think about if you've heard the term before, objectification of women or objectification of our bodies. Like that's where the objective, this is where that, that concept comes from, is from Mead's idea of object. So when we become the object, we're being looked at, that has potentially has an influence on us because now there's sort of some, we're aware of that sort of react, we're aware of others being, making observations of us and it can potentially alter our behavior, or at least we have to engage in that now and think about well, what does that mean when people are 
looking at me and I'm the object, what kind of meaning do I assign to that? So one of the principles of Mead's perspective is that we think before we act is before our behavior, when fun, before our behavior, before we act, we're thinking. We don't also necessarily think that this is conscious, deliberate, every action that we take, we're thinking about it, but we formed habits over a period of time. Um, but the focus of for Mead is that now actually we think about uh, before we before we behave, before we act, we go through a process of thinking. And it may be some act, some behavior so ingrained in what we do, we don't think about it any, anymore. But you get into a new environment around new people, a different context, then we become aware, right? We're more conscious of our behavior. So we're thinking before we're acting. What Mead's interested in is, we, is not only we think before we act, but we take the position of other. So when we're thinking, what are we thinking about? We're imagining how other people might see us. Um, so this is that taking position of other. And it could be the specific other. I should probably move these, move this up here, change them around. But it should be that we can think about how other, I take the position of a specific other, my mom, my dad, parents, friends, coworkers, you know, going to that job interview, um, attending class, my peers, the instructor, that I'm taking the, the role of specific other and how I imagine that specific other might view me. Like that's part of the formation of self. That becomes like I'm a that becomes moves me into the object a little bit. Huh, how does that person might see me, judge me, think about me? That becomes part of the objective sense of self. Then we get the generalized other. So it's no longer the specific, like an individual, but this cultural expectations, expectations in society itself. So much more this generalized other. You know, uh, there's there's gendered norms and norms and expectations around around race. There's um, different expectations just of behavior in general based on age and different status positions. So we're, we're thinking about what are society's expectations for being a person in this society? That's the generalized other. So what's going on here for me is that we're taking the role of other, either specific individuals or the generalized other. We're evaluating like whether or to behave in certain ways based on that interplay between thinking about myself of who I am, the subjective, and then thinking about how other people might might observe or, or assign meaning to my behavior, that's more the objective. And that's the sort of interaction going on between the two. Mead also has these different stages of development um, where like when we're really young, we are we are just imitating. So from birth to, a, I don't know, birth to, I can't remember what the age was, two years, something like that, that that little, that infants are imitating. That's what they do. That's, not, that's part of learning is imitating, you know, people in their environment, you know, they laugh, you know, they, they do all kinds of different things. Part of that may be more organic or physiological, but there's a lot of imitating going on, right? Peekaboo, right? A lot of imitating going on um, that's happening. Kids get a little bit older, they get to get to the play stage where they're stepping into roles, playing teacher, playing mom, playing dad, uh, playing a, you know, specific roles. It's an important part of learning. Now they're starting to develop the sense that there's different uh, positions in society. I mean, kids aren't thinking this complex with this complexity, but when they're in that play stage, they're playing out roles and they're imagining what it's like to be someone in that particular role. Uh, playing someone in terms of gender is a play thing going on in terms of certain age. Um, eventually, kids get to the point where a little bit more complex to get to the game stage where they start to actually change and move the rules around. They get more creative in terms of how they interpret the rules. Um, they're much more, it's much more complex, um, more more com complexity to thinking about role and playing out roles. So that's kind of the idea of Mead, ideas of self. Uh, Cooley, like I said, like a little bit overlapping, but here's a couple of quotes to kind of get it, Cooley. I imagine your mind, and especially what your mind thinks about my mind. So kind of get now we're getting to the space of of imagine how you think about who I am and what your me what your mind thinks about what my mind thinks about your mind. Man, this is crazy, right? So I imagine the way you're thinking about me and what your mind um thinks about the way I'm thinking about you. Um, Curly has this, okay, so we're taking, it's kind of like they're taking the role of other for Mead. 
but just a little bit different. Um, I am not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I, I am what I think you think I am. So if we get into like the self-fulfilling prophecy, if you ever heard that term, like somebody says, oh, you're, you're no good with math. I start to tell myself that, right? This becomes that sort of thing. I imagine how people might see me. And then all of a sudden there's kind of an error in thinking. And all of a sudden I reinforce that in terms of my own behavior or the way that I, you know, the way I carry myself, just like, or the way I think about myself, my self image and identity. It's based on that interaction component, right? Like didn't emerge out of the womb with an idea about whether or not I have strong math skills or not, but eventually may, or may eventually get to that space where I may I view and judge myself in a particular way based on my aptitude, whether I'm really good or not in terms of a particular aptitude. And that's all socially learned. Um, there may be some, you know, different people have different skill levels. This isn't about that. This is about by saying I'm no good at that. That's a self-image issue. Um, that's well beyond just whether or not an individual actually can do that work. So, um, okay. So we kind of walk through this. So the step one, imagine how other we look to others. So that's part of this looking glass self. Like there's an image shown to us like through the through others and this is like reflecting back so it gives me an image of who i am so i imagine how i how i look to others i evaluate that re reaction based on our perception of how others see us so i imagine how i might look to other people or how i might appear or how i might come across to other people i put some value and judgment on that uh, whether or not that's good or bad or place some value on that, on how I imagine other people might see me. And then I adjust my self-image based on that. So I, I, I say something funny, people, people laugh. I reinforce this idea that I'm funny. And then uh, potentially there's an adjustment to my self-image about that. I reinforce that idea. Or I say something funny and no one laughs. And then I'm like, and I can still tell myself, no, I'm really funny. It's just like, they, they don't get it. Or, uh, man, I'm not as funny as I thought I was, right? We're making some adjustment along the way. Now, to be aware, there's some potential errors for both Cooley and Mead. We could be wrong about the way we think about how others see us, right? So, like, look at body image. Other people may not be judging us the way we think that, we, they, that they are. One of the things that Mead offers that Cooley doesn't is that Mead gets us into the generalized other, like that cultural social component, so body image stuff may be coming from advertising, media, a lot of different spaces. So it's based on those kind of level of interactions of cultural, gendered cultural norms in terms of the body. Um, and that generalized other can have a real powerful impact on self-image and, and, and identity. So a couple of different examples I want to think about. So the movie Castaway, um, Tom Hanks movie, if you've ever seen it. So he's stranded on the, uh, a plane accident happens. He's the sole survivor. He's on an island trying to survive. He's he eventually there's he was on a it was a FedEx parcel plane. So all this kind of like some of these parcels are washing ashore. One of them is a is a volleyball um, and the name Wilson on it. So Wilson, he starts, he decorates or he makes a face out of the, of the volleyball and uh, he calls it Wilson. And I think this is a pretty powerful example that when we're alone and isolated, he was isolated without human contact. He's actually, we need to have that sense of connection to others to, to, to maintain our sense of self image and identity. When we're fully removed from society and others, it could have a real profound impact in terms of uh, our self-image, even formation of an idea of self, even if we have a, you know, he was, even if we're like in our forties and fifties, have a real strong self-image when we're removed from humans and society, it could have a, a significant impact in terms of our self-image. Things like solitary confinement, I mean, a lot of research in this area that this is very detrimental to humans when put it in solitary confinement. I mean, mental health, physiologically, it is a, um, it's a problem. It's an issue. Uh, full removal, 23 hours a day from human contact has a detrimental impact on, on individuals. And that, that's kind of like the importance of the looking glass self. I guess what I'm trying to stress is that we are social creatures. Being around others um, is important for our own self-image and identity. And it can be complicated and we can get ourselves into trouble sometimes if we're we're off in terms of how we're thinking about how other people might see us. 
but it's still an important part of who we are. And then the last example here is the TAG program, Talented and Gifted here in Central Oregon, kids who get identified as talented and gifted. I think it's like the, you can think about it as the uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, the Pygmalion effect. Uh, I wonder sometimes, you know, kids who are identified as talented and gifted, sometimes that label could be confining, but sometimes it also could be self-reinforcing and self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, like kids may be like, man, I'm smarter than others, right? And it may not be about aptitude and degrees of, of intelligence. Um, maybe there's something there, but maybe not, but it becomes a sort of belief and recognition. And maybe that itself actually facilitates greater academic achievement because people have that self-confidence coming into that particular environment. So that's things to think about from Cooley's perspective. If you want, if you're interested, you could you could look at, you know, just type this in your search engine, um, the mask you live in, killing us softly, just about gender and gender representations and their impact on, on us. Um, now we can kind of move to Goffman and Goffman's idea of dramaturgy. That for Goffman, it's all about performance, that that uh, we become based on our performance. So we're engaged in a theatrical perform theatrical performance. So it's very much similar to like a Shakespearean perspective, William Shakespeare playwright. And it's about addressing that we are engaged in impression management. We are presenting ourselves in different environments around different people. We may change our presentation based on the audience, the setting, location. And that's just part of who we are. Um, I mean, we can be chameleons. I don't like that kind of perspective. I don't know if that's the perfect metaphor, but um, I think there's some problems with that. It's I think Goffman's idea, what he's offering is that part of who we are is we are we do make adjustments based on the audience, people that we're around, the environment. This is, These aren't false senses of who we are. These are who we are in those environments. We're managing impressions. Uh, I don't know, a couple of things to think about for Goffman, like there's an interaction between the self and the audience. So the actors trying to give a compelling com performance, going to the job interview is a classic example, right? The individual is trying to give a compelling performance. They may dress in certain ways, be very conscious of their behavior, language, uh, the way they, the eye contact, all these different kind of components because they're trying to give a compelling performance in order to, to obtain that job. Uh, but we're, this is like where we're in the, if we're in the classroom, right? It's that self in the audience, uh, the instructor, the student, it's a lot of dramaturgy uh, going on potentially. Um, there's the language of, of the theater, the roles that the roles or the expectations for the position, the professor, the instructor, the student, the interviewer, the interviewee, like there's expectations, right? So we perform these roles. We have a script that goes along with that. Uh, things that we do, don't do, kind of like the cue cards for performing that role, a costume, a dress, an appearance, and then the stage itself, like the location, right, can have an influence. Think about the job interview, the, the role of the interviewee, um, certain things to do and don't do, right? Wouldn't be asking the interviewer, so how did you get started? You know, maybe you could be asking these questions, but I think you kind of get what I mean. Like there's certain expectations of being the interviewee, um, and the interviewer, these are different roles and expectations, different scripts to follow, language to use, language not to use, how to dress for the interview, like that's the costume part, right? And the stage, like where does it occur? Um, so yeah, it's like that kind of an idea. And part of Goffman's idea is that's through performance that we become. So we'll talk about later on the term gender and gender as a dramaturgical thing. And this idea of doing gender, we become or we develop a gender identity from Goffman's perspective by actually performing gender, our, our ideas about gender. We perform it, uh, I, we perform our conceptions of, of gender, and that's how we start to form gender identity. <laughs> For Goffman, there's like this thing you know, like off stage when we're not around other people, we're not engaged in impression management. Like that's one way of thinking about who we are, or one part of who we are. But then we get backstage, we're getting ready for the performance before going to the job interview, we're thinking about things, we're, get, we're getting ready for the performance. And then there's actually on stage when we're with the audience. We may alter our behavior in different these different stages. These are just different parts of who we are. It's not like one's right or wrong or fake or not fake, just different parts of who we are. Going to the doctor's office, there's a lot of stuff, dramaturgical stuff. People play the patient role. 
it's kind of interesting, right? When then you're in the waiting in the doctor's office, then the the the, uh, the medical personnel enters the room. Usually, people's behavior starts to change. Um, you know, just like they're playing a role, uh, as well as the medical staff are playing a role. The, the you know what the, what they wear, how they engage with the patient or the ind individual, all these different kind of things. The interview get pulled over by spe for speeding. How people interact with law enforcement, how law enforcement interacts with the public. There's a lot of dramaturgy in that space. I had an experience in a mental health center one time where when I was working as a clinician, um, went down to the front desk to pick someone up for uh, for a meeting, uh, for a session. They came back to the office and I had like my desk it was clear as my desk. And then there was some chairs and a couch and the person sat at my desk. Like, I mean, they had to like work at getting at my desk. And it was an act of, I think, probably defiance in some sort of way. Um, had a lot of control issues and anger management issues, but it was a violation of the script, right? I think is sort of the point here. Um, anyway, so that's Goffman and Dramaturgy, different way of, man, I think this is like, a, for me, like a fascinating thing to kind of look at is how to give a compelling performance of someone of a different gender than the one you identify with. And think about all the learning, like the ways in which we carry our hands, our walk, our demeanor, our language, our vocalization, the way we move our eyes and our eyebrows, the way we move our head, all these things that become part of who we are and what we do. We've learned that over a period of time, right? And that to give a compelling performance to somebody else of a different gender, it's like, it's gotta be incredibly complicated to be able to do that and an investment of time and energy and being aware, just super conscious aware of all these different ways in which gender enters kind of who we are. Gender is a performance kind of level. Okay. So let me kind of, kind of thinking about some time here. Um, can I talk about status? Really important. Status is a ranking. Um, it's like where people are positioned in a, in a social order, different kinds of status. There's the ascribed status, what's given to us at birth. So race is an ascribed status. Gender is an ascribed status. So if I, okay, uh, I guess let me talk about all, all of them first and then we'll go back to Cooley and Mead for a moment. So ascribed, given at birth, involuntary, achieved is things that you've done to actually accomplish that. So a person um, gets a certification to be working in automotive. I mean, that's like an achieved status to be a mechanic. Um, Master status is a status that has exceptional importance for oneself or for others. Uh, so sometimes a master, so a master status, a person, um, a person who has who uh, has an amputation, an amputee, like the amputee could be a master status. A person who served in the military that could be a master status. A person who uh, has exceptional abilities and it gets recognized for that could be a master status. Uh, could be a race, could be a master status where where it's exceptional significance to self or others um, is the idea of master status. Embodied status are our physical attributes, our height, our our sense of physical appearance. These are embodied statuses. So now, if I go back to uh, okay, well, link to culture. So the assignment of value, like an ascribed status, it's involuntary. It's given at birth. So thinking about race is a to be a person of color and to get assigned status from society is going to assign some status. If, depending on your ethnic group, your racial group, the racial group um, that's assigned that people belong to and identify with, whether the member of the majority group in society, the dominant group in society, or a community of color, like there's an ascribed status going on there. And that becomes important to recognize. If I go back to Cooley and Mead, the thinking about the self as a social process, and if people have really high expectations or not, or part of this, whatever it may be, right? It's that awareness of how other people might see oneself based on things like the color of a person's skin or their physical attributes, um, gender identity, different aspects of who we are. Now this becomes like a different um, part of, different people are developing their self in different environments based on something like the ascribed status. 
Um, and even things like master status, like what we kind of give the a lot of recognition to somebody who's been formally incarcerated or, or an adult who's been in custody and no longer in custody. And like the master status that could go along with that could have a profound and significant influence on self-identity and concept. Uh, so these are the things that we have to kind of think about. If I go to like places like, you know, an example of corporate CEOs, um, corporate executive officers, people who are at the top of a corporation, uh, there's a relationship between height and uh, and CEOs. CEOs are taller than the average person. Um, and there's been some studies on this that we give, like it's an embodied status. So we, we give a certain meaning to people who are taller and we give them sort of this meaning of that they're more, command more authority based on that. Or thinking about gender in the classroom or, uh, Think about if, if the instructor's male or female, just that ascribed status and having an impact on how other people might view um, the credibility of that particular instructor, just based on something like that. So that's kind of the idea of some things to consider with status. If I go back to like the idea of self-determination, so the metaphor, well, I think we're introducing the idea here of self-determination and maybe conclude, uh, include in the discussion status here. So self-determination is looking at the relationship between the individual, free will, people making a decision. So human agency, everybody has the ability to make a decision, but we're making that decision in a context. So the metaphor of the egg is like the egg yolk uh, is sort of like the free will, we could say. Like that's like, but then there's the egg white. This, what surrounds that is the context, historical, cultural, social context. And there sometimes in an environment, the egg yolk could be really big. We have a lot of choices available to us and we have a lot of support in making a lot of different choices. In another environment we go to, the egg yolk may be pretty small. It's like, there's not a lot of choices available in that environment or that context, or the pressure to make a certain decision is significant or to not make a decision is significant. So the individual level is the egg yolk. Determinism is more on the outside. So we have social determinism, the environment. So the time period we are in, the social location that we are in, you know, if I'm growing up in a family or in a community with a lot of with a lot of resources or a community without a lot of resources, like these are different social environments. People have different choices available to them in those environments. So we're thinking about that relationship the relationship between individuals and society. And then we get biological determinism, the sort of idea that it's our biology that's determining our behavior. So. Um, you know, we kind of get this complexity of trying to unpack the relationship between the individuals and social environments and our physiological, biological self. So the concept of self-determination is basically wrestling with that. The individual is making choices, but making choices within a context. Not everybody has the same choices available to them. Not everybody is supported in the same way of making those choices. Uh, choices are shaped by a lot of different factors could be like status positions, like ascribed status may be different, embodied status may be different. So this becomes our journey in life where we're trying to understand our journey and the journey of others, sociological imagination, by understanding history and culture and biography and even things like status and self-image and identity, like these become part of that picture. So I think there's the benefit, epigenetics is even like we're recognizing now today that the environment even influences influences us at a genetic level, mirror neurons, uh, reactions that we give based on cues in the environment. Like there's a lot of stuff going on that's like, it's complicated, right? And to realize the influence of the environment, even on us physiologically, it gives recognition as well as self-determination that the human story is not one of just like free will. Like people just determine whether or not or they're, you know, they're going to be poor or not or engage in crime or not. It's much more complicated than that. And we're trying to attend to the relationship between individuals and society. Okay, so let's talk about this concept. Um, yeah, so social construction of reality. We'll talk about this when we talk about race and gender. Basically, that um, constructs, language, uh, the way that we view the world, these are human creations, the, the way we assign meaning to things. The color of pink and blue and gender assignment is a relatively modern thing. It's a Western culture thing. We construct these ideas about what is pink and blue and the association with gender. Those are all human constructs. 
pink doesn't mean any particular thing, blue doesn't mean, mean any particular thing, but we come to, to define it that way, then it becomes real within culture itself. So we view the world through a sense of constructs. Sometimes constructs are very stable, where most people in society agree to things and they see the world through that particular lens. Uh, so they may be very stable, but they're open for change. Uh, part of understanding social construction of reality is that the language is paying attention to language. Language is important to making meaning. Uh, the way we think about individuals in prison, for example, the word like somebody is a convict, they're a prisoner. Now the language used more often is, is, is adults in custody. So it's like trying to understand that we're having different constructions and different meaning that we're assigning to individuals who are in that particular environment. These are different ways of thinking. And um, yeah, so it's like, you know, different con constructing reality is a human process. Meanings are very arbitrary. So there's no really reason why we have to define like somebody is a is a prisoner or a convict or adults in custody. I would argue and advocate that adults in custody is much more humanizing. Um, I definitely would not think that that's like coddling or not coming down hard enough and not giving enough stigma to people who are incarcerated. I think sometimes the label of that, the prisoner and convict is more about the person doing the labeling than the person who's actually serving time in custody. Uh, but these are different constructions of reality. They're arbitrary, but they're very real because if we define it that way, then we respond to the world based on our definition of it. Different examples like the dinosaur, and I use this in class sometimes that no one's ever seen one, but we all have an image of one. It could be based on, you know, like, and, and I mean, even like, I guess looking at paleontologists and rendi renditions or diagrams we've seen or pictorials we've seen or movies we've seen. These, these are all like best guesses, right? Uh, but then there's, you know, there's, there are fossil bones and there's connections that we can make to, uh, you know, genetic level testing, whatever it may be, um, to be able to have a better idea of what a dinosaur looks like. But anyway, I'm just trying to get across that no one's ever seen one, but yet we have a conception of what a dinosaur looks like. National flags, a lot of meaning going on there. Marijuana, so we'll kind of give you a couple different examples here. Prohibition, so prohibition of alcohol in the United States. I mean, that took a very specific construction of reality where alcohol for a period of time was viewed as the cause of crime and poverty. And there was a lot of anti-Irish sentiment going on, anti-labor sentiment going on at that particular moment in time. So a lot of stuff that went into influencing, identifying alcohol as the demon. And then we go to like marijuana, same way. I mean, marijuana doesn't have any particular meaning to it, but yet we assign, it gets assigned meaning. And so it became a menace in the 1940s, 19, 1930s. Uh, Harry Anslinger became the first uh, leader. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics was the first federal institution or federal government uh yeah, institution or body that was focused on specifically narcotic use or drug use and taking that kind of more criminal perspective. And there's a lot going on. This is 1930s. Uh, so we form a, form a whole new body in the government to address uh, drug, uh, drug use and drug-related problems and issues. Anslinger was the first leader of that. He was what we call like a moral crusader. He's Evangel he's very evangelical about ideas about drugs and that are damaged to society. And you can read through some of these quotes here, a lot of racism in what he's saying, uh, a lot of mis, I mean, there's like, there's a lot of hysteria that's going on. I mean, I won't go into the whole context, but it's a fascinating story. Um, yeah. So constructing like marijuana doesn't have any meaning, but people assigning it, assign it meaning. And we get to the 1980s and the war on drugs in the 1980s and we get to these things like we have about 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population is in the United States. And a lot of that came after the war on drugs in the 1980s. There was a ratio called the 500 to 5 ratio in the 1980s where if somebody had in their possession 500 grams of powder cocaine, they got the same sentence as 5 grams of crack cocaine. There's some race and class inequalities and uh, biases that are in that. Eventually that that policy, uh, the 500 to five or 101 ratio was viewed as, was deemed unconstitutional 
in the legal system because of disproportional impact on racial groups. There's race and class issues that were embedded in this. So this war on drugs that got created, there's a lot of historical context around that. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, we're constructing reality. Politicians were involved, both Democrats and Republicans, like like feeding the fever, uh, that time period of the sort of crack cocaine scare, powder cocaine scare, what was going on, and viewing it as a crime problem versus a public health problem. I mean, those are like two different constructions, right? Uh, Oregon recently went to, you know, to decriminalize um, and to not prosecute for possession. Now it's kind of reworking that. Like, you know, it's like it's, these are different construction and different ideas of trying to figure out how to develop a policy that provides access to care and to treatment, but also protects community and society as well. We can think about things like hegemony, that sometimes constructing reality becomes a propaganda tool, that hegemony is domination by consent, that you get the public to agree to getting tough on crime, to getting the war on drugs, you get people to agree to it. And then we develop these policies that have significant impact on our communities and people in very detrimental ways. I mean, that, that's, and it serves economic and political interests. That would be the hegemony. And then language superior warp hypothesis. If you're interested, this is Johan Ahari uh, wrote a book called Chasing the Scream. It's a really fat, he's a great storyteller. It's kind of about the war on drugs. Uh, there's a video you can watch of him talking about the, some of that work. Um, this is another, I think, a valuable video to kind of get at kind of the war on drugs. So if you're interested, we could talk about other topics as, as well. Talk about body hair, talk about women shaving their legs, very cultural, right? So there's no reason why had not having body hair underneath one's arms or on the legs or different parts of the body. Body hair has no inherent meaning. It's through culture and society, but it's very real, right? That if uh, during the month of January, called January. So for women who encourage women not to shave, not to en engage in the practice of removing body hair, you know, there could be value and judgment in culture and society because there's cultural norms and expectations. So it's kind of like thinking about self-determination, right? People making choices, but they're making choices in an environment. Sometimes we're not even aware that we're actually making that choice, right? So normalized and taken for granted uh, that may not even recognize that. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. So let's talk about group behavior a little bit. Um, <clears throat> This is a book I think is a really profound, a really interesting book called Rising Out of, ha Out of Hatred, a story of uh, this author who spends time with an individual who grew up in a white nationalist family group community, goes to college at a, college at a liberal arts school, and then ends up leaving the white nationalist group. So it's the story of that journey. And for me, when I read that book, it was <clears throat> really kind of illustrated the ways in which social environments can influence what we're exposed to, what we're supported in exploring or not exploring, and uh, the value importance ultimately of developing more diverse ways of thinking, um, being encouraged to think outside the box, uh, not being trapped by group conformity sometimes. Then um, there's a lot of group stuff that was going on in that space. So we talk about the robber's cave experiment. Um, you can like look up some videos, pretty interesting experiment, but 1990, a, a husband and wife team, 1949 to 54, they did these experiments uh, where they were looking at basically how people resolve conflicts. It's called realistic conflict theory. Uh, they set up an experiment in 1955, 1959 at Robbers Cave Park in Oklahoma. Uh, they induce conflict between different groups. Their, their question what, or what they're interested in is when there's conflict between groups and there's limited resources, kind of what can happen between different groups when that happens, when there's a struggle for resources. So in 1959, Robbers Cave, they took 22 kids, ages 11 and 12, all of them were white. They were middle class, they were Protestant. So it was a very monolithic, homogenous group. No one knew each other. Uh, they went through these three different stages. In the first stage, they were just they were they weren't they were in different groups. They were bonding. They were developing allegiance to their own group. They engaged in activities to help support that. Played games. They just basically the 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 Sharif and Sharif uh, or Sheriff and Sheriff. The the two researchers were encouraging bonding and connection. Stage two was the competition stage. They got the kids together now, the two groups, for four to six days, had them engage in competition, winners and losers. They actually try to facilitate like some pretty rugged competition. 
uh, try to create, facilitate division and separation. Um, they gave medals and awards, not to others, to some, you know, the winners versus the losers. Kids came up with the names of the, the rattlers. Um, what was the other group's name? Um, yeah, the two different groups, uh, they, they had their names. They saw themselves as being separate. They became a hierarchy. There was a competition for hierarchy and position. Kids started to get into fights. Verbal fights led to physical fights. Eventually, they had to separate the kids. And then they went through the third stage of reducing the friction. They brought the kids back together, had them work on common tasks, had them be in contact with each other, learn about each other. And through that, these kids actually started to develop. There was less tension and animosity. They, they, they got along. So what the Robbers Cave experiment kind of indicated is just that power of the group to really facilitate uh, certain kinds of behavior, but not only the group, but the structure that these kids were operating in, right? Uh, in some ways, Sheriff and Sheriff were facilitating conflict, generation of conflict in that environment. Okay, so humans are social animals. Um, yeah, there's conformity, right? Uh, conformity is valuable for, we all conform to a certain degree. It could be problematic at times if it's harm to self or others, but there's a tendency for humans to, to conform. Uh, belonging and connection are important. It can give us a sense of status, uh, opportunity. Ash's study on line conformity is a fascinating one where Ash, um, you can look up a lot of different videos, but Ash brings a group of people into an, in a room, shows them a line, and then shows them another image. And it has three different lines of different sizes. One of them matches up, clearly matches up the same line length in this in the uh, the larger with the larger image with the three different lines. Like it's clear that this line matches up, let's say with the one in the middle. So what Ash did is had sort of created a study where the people would be sitting around the table, subject would come in and the subject thinks that everybody at the table is a subject participating in this study, but and doesn't know that everybody else already knows what's going on. And they've been trained by the researcher to basically give certain responses. So only The only true subject is the one person sitting at the table. So they go around the table and they start to say, okay, which line this, you know, which line here matches with the ones over here. And then eventually what starts people start to do who know what's going on in the experiment, they start to say, oh, it's that line over there, which is not true. Um, but eventually people start to go, they start to, the desire to conform, the more and more people say, oh, it's line A, when clearly it's B and they say it's line A, uh, eventually more you know, people will start to conform because of pressure to conform. It could be that people are conforming because there's complying. Right? There's like it's group conformity. There's going along with the group. You know, it's like I'm not too invested. Like the the length of the line, whatever. I'll just say it's C. I'll just say it's B. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. It's compliance. And then there's internalization. We're actually changing your mind. Um, and I think what Ash is trying to demonstrate is that there's a human tendency to conform. It could get us into some trouble spots, but also we got to recognize it's a it's a human tendency. Standing in a line, uh, the greetings, hey, how's it going? You know, our response back, there's a little conformity in there. Pledge of Allegiance, going through the TSA at the airport. I went through looking for, I went and looked through uh, high school yearbooks, right? A lot of, you could just look at the images of kids, you know, it's like, man, a lot of conformity, right? You know, conformity is not a bad thing. It's a human thing. Uh, there was a flag I saw one time said, you know, be a lion, not a sheep. And I was like, well, that's really fascinating. This is like this conservative uh, kind of viewpoint and perspective about liberals. And I thought, huh, it's kind of interesting because all of us are humans and or all of us are social creatures. Lions need a group. They have a group. And part of that, I think, is just such a kind of a misunderstanding about certain kind of things. Anyway, um, real quick, Milgram and, and uh, Zimbardo. So Milgram, the shock experiment study. You can, again, find videos about this. You know, he's got this teacher, learner, student, people came into the environment um, where they were supposed to give a shock to pe a shock to the to the student. The student actually was part of the experiment. They knew what was going on. The teacher gave the student a question that the, the student was in another room. If they gave a wrong answer, then Milgram instructed the, the teacher to give the person a shock and then kept on increasing the shock um, level to 400 and some volts. And what was kind of, I think, something to consider with this experiment is that uh, compliance rates were around, you know, 40% on average. 
So it's not that most everybody complied. So I think that's important to remember. But also, like, you've got to think about, okay, what happens if you change the environment and you actually put a lot of other people around in that environment? I mean, you're here we're having the, the experimenter, the, the, you know, the experimenter and the teacher in one room and the experimenter telling the teacher to continue on. Well, you know, I think Milgram's created an environment where he's inducing conformity. I mean, uh, human behavior is more complicated than I think what Milgram is letting, letting it to be. Same with the Stanford prison experiment, where it's a mock prison, college students from Stanford University were picked up and from a, with mock prison cars. They were booked in a mock uh, police station, taken to a mock prison. After a few days, what, five, six days, I can't remember the number, Simbardo um, ended the experiment because prisoners started to treat Prison or pris uh, guards started to treat prisoners in very detrimental, harmful ways. Uh, but I'm not, you know, just came problems and issues in that environment. But I mean, again, it's thinking about we could, we could, it's dangerous if we start telling the story that, well, look, this is how humans are and who they become. Like, man, they're these, these creatures. Like, well, humans can. Uh, you can induce that. You can encourage those kind of things. But this isn't who humans are. Humans can be a lot of different things. And these are environments where they're inducing certain kinds of behavior. So kind of nearing the end, think about as another example, like Lord of the Flies. This is a story we told, if you're familiar with the story, kids get abandoned on an island, eventually it gets ugly. It's like, you know, it gets pretty wicked. Kids are cruel and brutal. So this was like a story told by this, this English author. But the reality, this is a story that, that people are fascinated by. You know, it's like what the bad that humans are kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's like here's a real life example, you know, of like kids were actually abandoned on it, abandoned. They took a boat out. Uh, they were during school one time. It's like, let's go on a little journey. They get on a boat, storm comes up, they get a shipwreck, they get left, you know, they get basically people thought they were dead, you know, 15 months they were on this island. They actually collaborate, work together. Like that's the real story or a story that humans actually collaborate and working together. This is a fascinating book. If you're interested in any of the subject area, I encourage you to read it. It's a fascinating book about, about humankind. And then finally, um, it's a little bit longer than I originally intended, um, but we got to address McDonaldization. So Max Weber, he's one of our theorists. We have Durkheim functionalism, Marx conflict theory, and then these micro level like Goffman, Mead, Cooley. And then we get Weber, who is looking at the increase of modernity and increased rationalization and science and bureaucracy. And he saw it as a double-edged sword that we could be like, like rationality brings, it helps us address human needs. You know, like we do things at a much more large level, we need to have bureaucratic institutions to be able to manage things, but also becomes an iron cage where we get trapped into rationality and it becomes dehumanizing sometimes. So the principles of McDonaldization are efficiency, Things are more efficient, and the, and the ideas generate more efficiency. Predictability, so things become more predictable. Uniformity, things are more the same, and then control through automation. So put more mechanical processes there to to remove the human uh, labor component and use uh, mechanics to be able to do that. So those are the principles: efficiency, predictability, uniformity, control through automation. So. They, uh, George Ritzer, who comes up with the idea of McDonaldization, his argument is that since the 1950s and on, more and more of our lives, our, our cultures and society have become McDonaldized. This goes back to like cultural leveling to a previous chapter. Um, that, man, it's our Mick vacations, Mick education, uh, Mick medicine, you know, Mick, all these different kind of things, right? It's just about efficiency and rationality and getting more and, um, Ooh, I think my four principles, it's efficiency, predictability and uniformity are one, control through automation. And then the fourth one is calculability, which is uh, more is better. Uh, things are cheaper so I can get more. So calculability is lower cost more and get more. So it's looking for, it's, it's the, because of the efficiencies, because of all those things, calculability is getting things that are bigger, cheaper. That's kind of the focus. So I don't know, part of McDonaldized jobs from a Marxist perspective becomes very alienating. So we have, we develop, you know, jobs in our work, the workforce and then what we do, if we become a cog in the machine, like it's very rational and get very productive, but also it could be very alienating where there's a lot of control placed on us as workers. 
Um, there's a disconnect between us as producers and consumers. We're getting further and further from that that connection. And so it's like it just you know it lacks that that same level of meaning. There's benefits to oh, so McDonaldization could be things from self checkouts to vacations to education, uh, healthcare, um, anything that involves like more and more of those things being focused on rationality, all these different principles, the modern day fat uh, you know um, warehouse. Amazon pickers and using the Amazon uh, warehouse of distribution distribution of goods. There's a lot of McDonaldization in that space. There's benefits, you know, but there's also consequences to that. Um, I think one of the things that's that's influencing McDonaldization for Ritzer it's it's consumer demand. People are actually more people are socialized into that to want to have that uh, predictability and uniformity. Um, and so there's a consumer demand, but also it serves the needs of capital. So capitalism benefits from that perspective, encourages that along uh, the power of capital to drive culture and shape cultures in ways that are more McDonaldized. Sometimes maybe that iron cage doesn't serve human interest or community's interest, but it's this economic motive that may triumph in that triumph in that space. The, the chicken has become McDonaldized. I mean the the. The, the, the growth and development of the chicken, the way it's been modified over time to produce, to go from basically from birth to from hatch to butcher and the size and the shape. I mean, these all, you know, using science and technology to facilitate that. You look at eggs in the store, you get eggs from, a, from your own chickens or from a local, uh, somebody who raises chickens. Eggs are different sizes, shapes, colors, whatever, right? But you know, the I mean, the egg is McDonaldized. Our, our food is McDonaldized. Um, they, even things like trash pickup, which is super fascinating. I mean, I remember as a kid growing up, you'd actually have people who pick up the garbage, actually be on the back of the back of the vehicle, and they'd stop and they'd pick things. You know, they'd throw the trash in the into the the trash can, the contents of the trash can into the back of the of the trash vehicle. Um, yeah, that's labor cost, right? So there's a benefit by having everything mechanical, um, but also a consequence, consequence to that too. Um, anyway, so a lot of things to consider to think about. Uh, I think that's, it went a little bit longer than I initially anticipated. Thanks for, for, uh, for hanging in there. Hope that was interesting, informative, uh, have yourself a great week and until next time signing off for now.